A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might have life through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, yet if we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is brought to perfection in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us, that he has given us his spirit. Moreover, we have seen and testify that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. Whoever acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God, and God in him. The word of the Lord. Be Lord, teach me your statutes. Lord, Lord, teach me your statutes. How shall a young man be faultless in his ways? By keeping to your words. With all my heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your commands. Within my heart I treasure your promise that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of my mouth. In the way of your decrees I rejoice as much as in all riches. Fobiscum et spiritu Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Mateum Jesus spoke to his disciples Do not be called rabbi You have but one teacher and you are all brothers Call no one on earth your father we have but one Father in heaven. Do not be called Master. We have but one Master, the Christ. The greatest among you must be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Verbum Domini. Today is the feast of the great St. Augustine. We have 
been in a time, especially in the 1980s, when St. Augustine was staunchly and explicitly rejected as a teacher. In fact, some teachers like Matthew Fox, formerly a Dominican, had taught that Augustine was the cause of all problems in the world. Uh, they even blamed the Cold War and the nuclear arms race on St. Augustine. He just saw bows, arrows, and spears in his day. But the reason for it was St. Augustine highly emphasized the need for Christ as a redeemer from sin. He understood that original sin is not a mere theological opinion. Original sin is a reality that we live. And he understood it because he himself saw the development of the effects of concupiscence. Remember what concupiscence is. This is the word that describes how we have desires for God's good creation. The creation is good, and the desires are good, but the desires easily get out of order. And while we want food, sometimes we want so much that we become gluttons. We want to have private property and possessions, but we want it too much, and then we become avaricious. And we just store it up for ourselves as if there were some sort of a luggage rack in your hearse. Sometimes we become so desirous of sexuality. This is a good, this is how the human race continues on. But then the disordered desire turns into lust. And all these different disordered desires are the result of original sin. And St. Augustine knew it from himself. And it's not only in application to the desires for physical things. These sins can also be very much in the, mind, in the intellect. You have freedom of thought in this country in a way that is unprecedented in human history, and that's good. Unless, of course, you're at certain universities, then you can't think freely. But apart from those, by the law, you have freedom of thought. But that does not make all thoughts moral and good. Some thoughts can be very, very sinful. And St. Augustine knew both the disorder of thought and the disorder of his other physical desires, his fleshly desires. Though, of course, keep in mind, when St. Paul speaks of the fruit of the flesh, his term for concupiscence, St. Paul includes the intellectual disorders, such as heresy, within them. St. Augustine was born to a mixed marriage. His mother was born and raised a Christian. And she had her own struggles with concupiscence, as he describes in his wonderful book, The Confessions, which, by the way, I urge all of you to follow the advice of Sister Ida, who taught me eighth grade. God rest her soul. She, we thought she was old then. She probably wasn't, but she seemed that way. But she said, Make sure you do not die without reading St. Augustine's Confessions. So I read it in eighth grade, didn't understand it, but thought I'd rather get it under my bucket list right away. <laughs> and I've read it since with more comprehension and more than once. 
I urge you to do that. But in his confessions, St. Augustine describes how his mother had struggled with abuse of alcohol when she was young. So that her conversion was also of a moral one. As was common, she married young. And her husband was a pagan, Patricius, Patrick. And unlike the Patrick of Ireland, uh, he was a pagan who lived like a uh, pagan. He was unfaithful to her throughout their marriage till the end of his life when he finally converted. And she prayed for him constantly to stop that abuse within their marriage as well as to come to know the true Christ. Augustine, as a boy, was in, outraged by his father's behavior. His, he loved his mother very much. And his father's mistreatment of her infuriated him, but so also did her forgiveness of him and her willingness to take him back again and again equally infuriated him. So he wanted neither the way of life of his father nor the Christianity of his mother. She had taught him as a boy, but he, the father wouldn't allow him to be baptized till he was older. And what they all noticed is that he was extraordinarily bright. And so a friend sponsored him. This was the way things were in those days, that somebody who was wealthy might well sponsor somebody else. Of course, you owed them, you know, in social support and things. That's been the Roman system. But he, so he paid for Augustine to go to school and in the big cities. And so he studied and studied well, and he studied to be a lawyer, what they called a rhetor, or where they studied rhetoric. And the problem with it is he saw himself is that a rhetor who could speak eloquently could get criminals who were clearly guilty off of the crime only because they knew rhetoric. And eventually, while Augustine was learning style, again, that's, it was all about style. So they would read Cicero in order to learn style so they could convince their opponents of anything and get their clients off in a court case. But he also started to read in Cicero about philosophy and how there is such a thing as truth. He was trained in this absolute kind of um, you know, uh, irrelevance of truth, but he uh, discovered in the thought of Cicero the content, what, not just the form of sentences, but the meaning which was, you have to seek what's good and true and beautiful for its own sake. And that was the first step in his conversion. Now, he, again, rejected his mother's Christianity, so he joined a group called the Manichaeans. And this was a group that hated the physical world. They thought the physical world was created by an evil god and that the God of the Old Testament was evil. It's typical Gnosticism, whereas only the spiritual is good. And so Augustine bought in, that sounded more noble. And as he followed that though, he didn't quite live it because he shacked up with his girlfriend and they had a baby together and he kept her for as long as he lived in Africa till he finally went over to Italy to get a better job. And when he was in Italy getting a better job as a rhetor, as a lawyer, and trying to get into the imperial court, having a low-class concubine was not acceptable. He wanted to marry a high class. In fact, his mother helped to arrange a marriage, so he just sent his uh, girlfriend back to Africa. 
and she becomes unknown to us. We don't even know her name because he did not love her. He had an affection for her, to be sure. And even as he was waiting for marriage into a wealthy family to move up in status, that was the purpose of his marriage, too, was to move up in status as a country kid from North Africa. He get into a good noble family in, in Milan. In that time, he still could not control his sexual impulses. He was going to parties and to prostitutes on a regular basis. And at the same time, he began to listen to the sermons. Monica and his mother encouraged him to go listen to the sermons of Bishop Ambrose of Milan. And the sermons made sense, more sense than the Manichaeans. In fact, when he finally met the leader of the Manichaeans, he realized the man was a thorough fool who knew nothing. It had no, there, there was, it was totally self-contradictory. And the guy couldn't explain the contradictions. And so he knew that that was wrong. And Bishop Ambrose began to explain the Christian faith in a way that he began to know this is right. This is true, and Christ is the Redeemer. However, even though he began to see that it was true, he could not, as a matter of fact, he did not want to overcome his lusts. He said, Lord, make me good, but not yet. He wanted to continue in the sins because as happens with any of the impulses of the flesh, they become addictive. People who are within those impulses and are living those impulses say, well, I need to let off steam. So I need to go get drunk. I need to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever it might be. And you're not letting up steam, off steam. You're creating a bad habit and begin to manipulate other people, as he did. Until finally, finally, knowing that the Christian faith was true and that his own behavior was evil, Augustine was told, he heard some kids in a sing-song voice saying, take and read, take and read. And he looked at Romans and he began to realize, I'm right, I can't give up my sexual sin. I can't give up my addiction to prostitutes. And I guarantee you, from knowing people, not only by reading the past, but also knowing people in the present, just because somebody gets married does not mean that they give up their addictions to other things. Just because somebody makes a commitment with vows in religious life, if they become addicted to sexual misbehavior, they don't give it up so easily because that habit is very difficult and as the alcoholics and sex addicts and others will all say very clearly, I am powerless over the thing to which I am addicted. I am powerless over booze or drugs or sex or again, whatever it might be, I'm powerless. But God is not powerless and that's what Augustine had to learn. God had to be the one who made it possible by his grace to overcome his addiction to the sexual misconduct in his life. And then, as a result, he made a conversion, spent time in retreat away from all the women of Milan and all the other misbehaviors at the parties and such. And then finally, he and his son, Adeodatus, were baptized. And he planned to live his life as a layman in penitence for his past sins. He planned to be celibate the rest of his life. And he planned to use his life to teach others about the truth of the faith. He spent time as a layman refuting the errors of the Manichaeans and some of the pagans, etc. But his bishop saw in him that there is another quality, and he pretty much insisted, you need to get ordained a priest. 
I need you in this diocese of Hippo. And then he was ordained the co-juder bishop. And when the bishop died, he became the bishop. This was not his plan. He was not someone who sought a career as a bishop. And in fact, it would cause him great difficulty. But he used that position to teach. And uh, there's a saying in theology that anyone who claims to have read everything Augustine ever wrote is probably lying because there's so much. St. Augustine took on all the different errors of his day, errors within the church, errors of heresy, like the Donatists and others, the error of Pelagius, who denied original sin and who said that we can save ourselves by our own efforts. He took on those who didn't understand the role of grace and the centrality of Jesus Christ in our salvation. And he took on the critiques of the pagans who blamed the church for the invasions of Europe and the empire by the barbarians. He took on and then he confronted the barbarians because they came as he was dying. The city of Hippo was surrounded and they, his priests barely escaped with his books from a burning building. And they fortunately brought them to Italy. And we have them because of that. And what I urge is that this great African leader and saint who became the number one teacher for the next 800 years of the church and until St. Thomas Aquinas came and took his teaching and even deepened it further. He didn't refute it. He deepened it and gave it greater context. But this great teacher of the last, what is it now, 1,600 years, it's over, almost 1,700 years, this great teacher needs to be our teacher as we deal with crises inside the church, inside our society, it's crises that sometimes parallel his. And our goal is to make sure that we come to Christ and we focus on Jesus, our Lord. We don't let the sinners distract us from Jesus, our Lord, because then the devil gets a two-for-one sale, the sins of the bad people, and then he gets us to leave Christ. No, we come ever closer to Christ as Augustine did. And then we, like Augustine, become forces for the transformation of our lives and the lives of the people around us and even after us for the glory of God.